All right, I think this is where we left off. We had done our little... Confusing. Not confusing, crystal clear, right, Crystal? Crystal clear. Yes? Everybody okay with directionality? Or at least... Leading, lagging, strand, DNA, replication, right? Sorry? You're all saying no. Cameron. All right, I put this up. I was going to have you all come do it, but this is more for the, um, for the video because I'm not quite sure how much it captured the chaos last class. I think you guys saw it, but I'm not quite sure the video is wide enough. All right? So let's just say this is a parental strand of DNA, and I'm going to assemble a daughter strand. Okay? I'm going to assemble a daughter strand. Now, don't worry about helicase, and don't worry about the double-stranded piece that's being unzipped by helicase. Right? This is the single-stranded parental strand of DNA. All right? It's been unzipped. It acts as the template for the daughter strand to be assembled. Okay? Now, what's the rule? DNA polymerase can only add to which end of the growing daughter strand? The three prime, right. And so the daughter strand, what? Would this be the three prime or five prime end? So this would be the three prime end, right? So, DNA polymerase moves in what direction along the parental strand? So, DNA polymerase has to move in this direction, right? Has to. No. I will show you a slide in a moment how you can unequivocally determine which is 3 and 5 prime. So, we're going to start here. What is DNA polymerase going to add? A T. A T. What end is this? So this must be the 3 prime side, right? So what's it going to add now? G. And this must be the three prime end. All right, all's good. Okay, if that's the leading strand, helicase would be here, flying down this way, right? There's helicase, and the leading strand copies in the same direction that helicase flies. But it's different for the lagging strand, okay? Here's helicase flying down that end, so I don't have to untape these and, and tape them down here. All I'm going to do is change our directionality, okay? So helicase is flying down in this direction. Unzipping, untwisting, with the help of some other enzymes. So that's how it happens for the leading strand. Now let's have a look for the lagging strand. So the lagging strand, let's just say this then would be the 5 prime, right? This would then be the 3 prime. All right? So we've switched strands. Everybody okay with that? And as a result, we've switched directions. Helicase is still flying down in that direction, but... DNA polymerase can't follow it, right? No, can't. DNA polymerase only goes along the parental strand in the 3 to 5 prime direction. Can only add to the 3 prime side of the growing daughter strand. So we've got to go in that way, even though helicase is going down there. Okay? So, let's go. All right, so by the time polymerase has got here, where's helicase? Another 20 strands down. All right, another 20 bases down. So then polymerase has to run to catch up, and it flies back down in this direction, and it has to run and catch up and fly back down in that direction. Got it? We all good? Leading, lagging strands? Okay. Sure? 
Yeah, but it, at the end of an hour and 15 minutes, you guys need to get up out of your seats. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now three and five prime ends. Let's have a look at that. The five and the three refer to the number of the carbon atoms on the sugar molecule in the nucleotide. So first let's look at this. This is a nucleotide. All right, let me just kind of draw it how I've been drawing it. The nucleotide consists of a phosphate. There's our phosphate. Okay, and a sugar. There's our sugar. In the case of DNA, it's deoxyribose. And a base, a nitrogen base. There's one of four. And I'll just write NB nitrogen base. So that's how I've drawn it so far, right? But can you see how it translates to that? Yes. Either or. Phosphate, there you go, you've got the P. Okay? Sugars, you know, you've got hexose and pentose sugars. Well, there's a pentagon there for your pentose sugar. All right? And the nitrogen base, well, you know, they're, they're, they're quite big. So, let's have a look at this sugar. <clears throat> the nitrogen base is attached to carbon number one. You know that's a carbon there because there's an apex and there's no letter. So just by convention, because carbon's so common, we leave off the carbon, right? Cast your mind back, first couple of weeks of semester, yeah. So this is carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, carbon number five. In this instance, the phosphate is attached to carbon number five, okay? Up here is the five prime side of this nitrogen base. Here's carbon number three, another phosphate would attach down there. <clears throat> so that's the three prime side. Okay? Now let's flip this, because remember DNA runs anti-parallel. So the strand, if it ran in this direction, this would be the five prime end up here, three prime end down there. Now let's flip the base around, the nucleotide, sorry, around. Here's our number five carbon, facing in this direction, and here's our number three. So this would be the five prime, this would be the three prime. Now, I've got another little, watch this, okay? Here's a base, just like that. Let's add to it, okay? Let's add to it. Let's add to it. Which is the five prime end, top or bottom? Where's the three prime? Right. Now let's go the other way. Runs anti-parallel. Right, so we flip them. Okay. Now remember, these bases would be joined by what kind of bonds? Hydrogen. All right. See the way it goes the other direction? You can see it very clearly here because the pentagon's facing the other direction. So there's our five prime end up there. So this must be, and five prime, three prime, okay? And it all has to do with those number three, number five carbons, which direction they're facing. You okay with that? And so now let's sort of put it in, you know, di this, this kind of form. What's this? Sugar. All right, let's add them, let's join them together, just like that, okay? Where's the five prime? Top. Just think of that little pointy bit of the pentagon points to the five. Okay? And then let's go the other strand. Well, it runs the other direction. Okay? So five prime, three prime. Okay? And it just has to do with where the, the carbons, those threes and fives, which direction they're pointing. Now, I know I put all these as, as the same colours, four different nitrogen bases. I probably should have coloured them differently. If this was an A, what would this be? 
And how many hydrogen bonds would there be between them? And you say if this was a G, what would this be? And how many hydrogen bonds? Three. Right. And how can you tell? Three. 82 CG3. Right. OK, so are you good with DNA replication then? Yep. Now we're going to move on. We're going to move on to see how proteins are made from DNA. All right. How proteins are made from DNA. Proteins are incredibly varied molecules. There are hundreds of thousands of different kinds of proteins. I know I put here 10 to 100,000 different proteins, but there are tens to hundreds of thousands. Tens to hundreds of thousands. Okay? Different kinds of proteins. Obviously, it depends on the organism, how complex it is. Immensely varied. And the proteins are involved in every single metabolic reaction. And we've talked about the roles of proteins, right? Whether they're enzymes, whether they have a messenger role, a receptor role, contractile role, do loads and loads of different things. And of course, it's those metabolic reactions that make you tick, literally, make you function. And make you unique. So, here is how we go from DNA to proteins in a nutshell. The directions or the information is encoded in the DNA. Specifically, it's the order of the nucleotides in the gene. That's the information. Just like the order of letters in a word, or the orders of words in a sentence, give the word or sentence its meaning, it's the order of nucleotides within the gene, which is the important information. OK? That genetic information is decoded. And it's decoded, and that information is used to assemble amino acids in a specific order in the protein. It's used to assemble amino acids in a very specific order in the protein. Okay. What do we call that part of protein structure, the sequence of amino acids in the protein? What do we call that layer or level of protein structure? Primary. The primary structure of a protein is the sequence of amino acids in that protein. The sequence of amino acids is determined by the sequence of nucleotides in the gene. And of course, the sequence of amino acids in the protein determine the structure of the protein and therefore its function. Now, each gene has got a unique code. Each gene has got a unique DNA sequence. And so each gene will make a different protein. In fact, it's more complicated than that. But that's sort of this central dogma. One gene equals one protein. <clears throat> How many genes do you have? How many genes have you got? How many genes you got? I've told you before, and it's in your lab. How many? You're a, you got the 30 right, a couple of orders of magnitude off. No, about 30,000 genes. <clears throat> now, let me qualify that by saying, as we learn more about genes and what genes are and how many we've got, the number changes. It changes almost on a weekly or yearly basis. So that number of 30,000, well, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it comes down. Right now, we're on an upswing. 
Maybe 30 to 50,000 genes is what we've got. Okay? Not all of them have been identified. Many of them have. And so in another 10 or 20 years, that number might change. Well, in fact, it certainly will change. So there's something to think about. We've got 30 or 50,000 genes, but we can make hundreds of thousands of different kinds of protein. So this one gene makes one protein, you know, there's a disparity there. Okay. The protein then, of course, gets assembled. Its primary structure is determined. It folds into its specific conformation. And then go does something. And that will have an effect on your phenotype. Hopefully, the, functions all, the proteins all function correctly. So you have a, a normal phenotype. Sometimes they don't work properly, and that creates problems. Yeah. Phenotype. Phenotype is, OK, think about it like this. First, think about it as your physical appearance, the physical characteristics that you have. So I'll start off at a very macro level. Color of your eyes, whether you can roll your tongue, whether your urine smells stinky after eating asparagus. All right? And let's go down to a... That's common amongst the English. <laughs> Come and wear this hat. So you can have phenotypes that are not just on the physical level, what you look like, but on the biochemical level. Your blood type is a phenotype. What blood type you are is a phenotype. And that's determined by molecules on the outside of your cells. Okay? So phenotype is a physical parameter about you you can measure. And some phenotypes are determined entirely by genes. Some are determined mostly by genes. Some are determined not at all by genes, by the environment. Okay? Whether you can roll your tongue is a phenotype that is 100% genetically determined. Okay? Whether you have fetal alcohol syndrome, all right? There's a certain phenotype associated with that. That's almost entirely environmentally determined. Okay? And then the color of your skin is one that has a genetic and an environmental component. Okay? All right. Okay. So let's think about genes then. Now, when I was first introduced the word genes, and I was very little at school, and I just got very confused with genes and, and you know, genes that you wear. I just thought it was so bizarre that we would have this length of DNA that was called a gene. Who come up with that? Maybe. All right, so genes then are simply lengths of DNA that code for a protein. Just lengths of DNA that code for a protein. Here's a picture of a chromosome from the salivary glands of a drosophila. You know what drosophila are? No. No? Really? Fruit flies. You leave some bowl of fruit out or a bottle of wine, these little flies are attracted to the fruit and the wine. Where do they come from? They're just around. But they're attracted to that smell of fermentation because they actually don't eat the fruit but they eat the yeasts that are feeding on the fruit. And they actually carry their own species of yeasts with them. And when they land on your bit of fruit that's got a little bit of damage on it, they'll inoculate that little bit of damage with a, a, a species of yeast. The yeast then multiplies and, and the adults and the larvae feed on the yeasts. But don't worry. You eat yeast all the time, right? So, but it just so happens that these fruit flies, Drosophila, have very large salivary glands, and the chromosomes in the salivary glands of Drosophila are extremely large. You can pull off their heads quite easily, make a squash of their salivary glands, and the chromosomes are so big they're easy to view under the microscope. That's why they're looked at. Okay? They're called, okay? They're called polytene chromosomes. So anyway, they're very easy to look at, very easy to photograph, and they don't have many of them. 
along a chromosome, and you can see this one's been mapped, it's got numbers and letters, we can identify the location of specific genes. We've done it with your chromosomes as well. We know where a lot of genes reside on the human genome. We know what chromosome they're on and where the position within the chromosome that gene resides. So a gene then is just a functional length of DNA, a length of DNA that codes for a protein. Okay? All right. So the sequence of bases and DNA encodes the information. I know I've told you this already. I'm just telling it in a slightly different way. Try not to write it down word for word. DNA remains in the nucleus. All right? DNA doesn't leave your nucleus except during you know, mitosis. All right? There's some movement there. But during the normal functioning part of the cell, during the G1 phase of the cell cycle, the DNA resides within the nucleus. Okay? And the S and G2. It stays in the nucleus. But proteins are made in the cytoplasm. Okay? So the information is in the DNA. DNA stays in the nucleus. Proteins made in the cytoplasm. Now, on what proteins are made in the cytoplasm? No, not yet. DNA stays in the nucleus. Proteins are made in the cytoplasm. The information in DNA is used to make the proteins. All right? So. Ben, can I use you again? Yes. Yeah. Do you mind wearing the hat, though? You need to wear the hat. All right. There. Now, this hat is the ribosome hat. Okay? So, go stand over there. That's the ri No, that's the special ribosome hat. Okay? Pro Proteins are assembled, oh, no, you've got to stand up. Proteins are assembled on ribosomes. Okay? Talked about ribosomes. Where do ribosomes reside? Good. In the cytoplasm, many of them on the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, ribosomes are actually made in the nucleus. They're made in the nucleus and they're shuttled out very quickly into the cytoplasm. Okay? DNA stays in the nucleus. Here. Oh, I forgot my hat then. I was going to wear a hat. But, uh. So I'm DNA, all right? I'm in the nucleus, okay? I've got all the instructions, but I never leave the nucleus. Imagine there's a boundary there, right? It's the nuclear membrane. I never leave. Ben is a ribosome. He has to assemble a protein based on the instructions I give him. Now imagine we're in a cell. Start making proteins. Come on, make the proteins, Ben. How? <laughs> how? How, did, how does it do it? What does it yell out? Hey, give me an A, give me a T. RNA comes out. Yes. So there's a messenger molecule. No cell phones, no text. There's a messenger molecule that's made in the nucleus that takes the information from the DNA out to the ribosome, the ribosome can then interpret that information and make a protein. And what's that messenger molecule called? Messenger RNA. All right. Okay. All right. Good job, Ben. <laughs> I'll let you wear the hat, the whole class. How about that? <clears throat> it's a good hat, isn't it? So, the information coding DNA is transcribed into RNA, messenger RNA, which then moves into the cytoplasm. We need this messenger molecule. Okay. So now we're going to look at this process. We're going to look at how DNA conveys the information to this messenger molecule. Messenger molecule takes it out to the ribosome, and then how the ribosome interprets that information to make a protein. Okay? Do you want to see the movie first? 
gives you goosebumps. It gives you goosebumps. It does. <laughs> Imagine learning about this stuff your whole life, but never being able to visualize it. All of a sudden, someone comes out with a movie that enables you to visualize it. That's a remarkable thing, isn't it? Music's great. Love the music. All right. So now let's have a look. This process of going from DNA to messenger RNA is called transcription. All right, now I'll give you all of this, but I just want you to look at the movie first. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. How a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. It begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. A gene is simply a length of DNA instructions stretching away to the back. The assembled factors trigger the first phase of the process, reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. Everything is ready to roll. Three, two, one, go. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to copy the A's, C's, T's, and G's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related building block known as U. watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. That's good stuff, isn't it? Did it? No. At least humor me. You couldn't see the lagging strand in that. Sorry? There's no leading and lagging scram. Not talking about DNA replication. We're talking about a completely different process now. There's no leading, leading lagging strand here. This is not DNA replication. This is taking the information in DNA and transcribing it to a messenger RNA molecule. So hold on, hold your horses. All right, so I just wanted to give you that. It might not make too much sense now, but let's talk about all of the processes that went on. First, I want to talk about the structure of RNA. All right, RNA stands for what? Anybody know? Ribonucleic acid. And it's a close cousin of DNA, as the lady in the video said. But it differs in a couple of ways. RNA does have a phosphate, does have a sugar, and it does have four nitrogen bases. So far, very similar to DNA because it is a nucleic acid. So, phosphate, sugar. The phosphate is a phosphate. The sugar is a different sugar to what's in DNA. And it does have four nitrogen bases. Okay? So, phosphate, the sugar, 
Not deoxyribose sugar, just ribose sugar. All right, just ribose sugar. And it does have a nitrogen base. So that's the nucleotide that makes up RNA. Okay, very similar to the nucleotides that make up DNA, but a different sugar and does have four nitrogen bases. It does have a C like DNA, it does have a cytosine. It does have a guanine like DNA. It does have an adenine like DNA, but it doesn't have a thymine. Doesn't have a thymine. Thymine is replaced by this base called uracil. Okay? The same pairing rules apply, except T is replaced by U, thymine replaced by uracil. So let's have a look at the nitrogen bases in RNA. We've got an A, a C, a G, and a U. No T. So similar rules apply. So what might be our pairing rules? A would... Yeah, but here's the thing. RNA is a single-stranded molecule, not double-stranded. So the only pairing that goes on in RNA is pairing, it's not exactly true, but mostly true, all right, is pairing between the DNA and the RNA. So, in red, I'm going to write just a little DNA sequence down. And now I'm going to write the complementary messenger RNA sequence. Okay? What would pair with a T? What would pair with an A? No, there's no T in messenger. Ah, U, okay, good. What would pair with a G? And a C. And a T. And an A. U. Because this is messenger RNA. There's our DNA. Okay? There's our phosphate, there's our sugar, and our four nitrogen bases, cytosine, guanine, adenine, no T, no thymine, but there's uracil. Uracil, U-R-A-S-I-L. I think. Is that right? Yeah. Sorry? Is it with a C? No. It's an S? Yeah. So, differs to DNA in that it's single-stranded. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. It's a C. Is a C? Can you say it's an S? U -R -A -C -I -L. It's a C. Sorry, it's a C. You are... A C I L. Thank you, Cameron. I'm sure in England it's spelt with an S. So RNA is a single stranded molecule and it's got U not T. Okay? It's got U not T. So keep those rules straight. Now, even though I said it's a single stranded molecule, that single strand can kind of wrap around on itself and it looks like it's double stranded. Okay, and I'll show you a diagram of that in a moment. So, there are three different kinds of RNA that we need to be concerned with. Three different kinds of RNA that we need to be concerned with. We've got messenger RNA, don't write this down yet. We've got M RNA, T RNA, and R RNA. The M stands for messenger RNA. And I think these names are quite descriptive. The T stands for transfer. 
and the R stands for ribosomal. Okay, three different kinds of RNA. Now we're going to have a look at the structure of each of them. So first let's start with messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, very simply, single-stranded strand of RNA. That's all it is. Let's just draw it. It's very easy. Do it in red. Draw it. Draw it. All right. All right. So, does someone want to just give me a messenger RNA sequence? Sorry? Sure it's got a T? Oh, sorry. Who said guacamole? I knew it. All right. So here's a strand of messenger RNA, okay? And the nitrogen base would be connected to a what? No, this nitrogen base in a strand of messenger RNA would be connected to a sugar, which is connected to a phosphate, which is connected to a sugar, which is connected to a phosphate, connected to a sugar, connected to a phosphate, connected to a Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Okay? And let's write the sugar there. What are the bonds that are holding the backbone, these components together? Covalent bonds, so I'll do them. Okay? And what are the bonds joining the sugar to the nitrogen base? What are the bonds joining the sugar to the nitrogen base? No, covalent. Thank goodness it's not a hydrogen bond. So there we go, single-stranded molecule. I'm not going to draw the sugars and phosphates. I'll draw it. There's a sugar and a phosphate for each nitrogen base, right? Correct, because that's the nucleotide unit. Okay. And the backbone of DNA and RNA is alternating sugar phosphates. Okay. I'm not going to draw it like that. I'll just simply draw it like this, okay? Okay? Don't need to draw the backbone, right? You know what's in the backbone. Okay? So that could be a very short strand of messenger RNA. Pretty straightforward so far yet? Just remember that rule, single-stranded, U not T. Now let's look at transfer RNA. Transfer RNA, a little different. Transfer RNA has this basic structure. Now I'm going to draw it a little differently. In my diagram, I'm going to draw it a little differently. I'm going to draw it like this. I'm going to draw it. kind of as a cross. All right, you can see where my cross comes from, right? Okay. Now, can you see here my single-stranded piece of RNA comes down here, loops and it see the way it sort of loops back on itself. And I know this looks like it's a double-stranded double-stranded, but we just have one strand, you can follow it that loops back on itself. Does that make sense? Yeah? It's not two separate strands like DNA. And each transfer RNA molecule carries an amino acid. I'm just going to write alpha alpha to indicate amino acid. Okay? Each transfer RNA carries an amino acid. How many different amino acids are important in, in us? 
20. So how many different kinds of transfer RNA do we have? There are 20. They differ only, well, not only, they differ mostly, in the amino acid that they carry. Okay? And transfer RNAs also have this region down here. I'm going to draw it kind of like that, a bit like a trident. And this has three nitrogen bases, three nitrogen bases. And we call this part of the tRNA molecule the anticodon. The anticodon. All right, call that part the anticodon. And it's simply a sequence of three nitrogen bases. So have a look on the diagram and you can see that down there. See the three nitrogen bases at the bottom? It doesn't really look like this, but you can think about it as looking like that. Okay? So the business ends are the anticodon, where the amino acid is. Now, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. See these little arms out here? Don't draw these in your diagram, all right? But I'm going to draw it and then quickly erase them. They've got almost like little hands that can hold on to another transfer RNA, okay? Okay? All right. Now, 20 different amino acids, 20 different transfer RNAs. Each amino acid will have one or several codon, anticodons specific for that amino acid. Now, I'll show you a table in a minute where you can read these off. But, for example, an AUG anticodon would have, oh, I hope that's not a stop or start codon, but an AUG would have a unique amino acid associated with it. Okay? An ACG would have a different amino acid associated with it. Does that make sense? I'll go into more detail in a moment. No, one doesn't. Um, no, one doesn't necessarily determine the other. It's well, actually, yeah. The anticodon determines which amino acid it carries. The anticodons never leave the transfer RNA molecule, but the amino acids get dropped off and rejoined, dropped off and rejoined. So that's the transfer RNA. Now, if there's an anticodon, shouldn't there be a codon? Yeah. Where do you think codons are? Shouldn't there be a, a matching corresponding codon? There is. So, your messenger RNA molecule that you just drew, if an anticodon is a group of three nitrogen bases, what do you think the codon is? Three. A complementary cluster of three nitrogen bases. So what was this sequence in the messenger RNA strand you just drew? Is that it? Okay. So, go back to that diagram you drew. This group of three there forms a codon. There's no space between them, no, no, no real space between one codon and another. This would form a codon. Didn't I give you another one? Didn't I give you nine? I did. What was the ninth? What did I give you? All right. So there's another codon. So you can think of a codon as just a cluster of three nitrogen bases 
which a functional cluster of three nitrogen bases in the messenger RNA. So if this is one codon in the messenger RNA, let's just take this first codon, GAC, what would be the complementary anti-codon sequence? C, U, G. Okay? You okay with that? Ah, all be revealed. I'm just like telling you who the players are right now, and then we're going to shove them on the stage and do the play. Okay? Um, ben does. The codon is in the messenger RNA. The anticodon in the tRNA. Okay? Yes. Go back to your messenger RNA sequence you drew and now then add the codons. Codons and anticodons pair up. So if you know the DNA sequence, you can determine the messenger RNA sequence, right? And if you know the messenger RNA sequence, you know the codons. If you know the codons, you know the anticodons. If you know the anticodons, you know the amino acid order, right? Yep. The anticodons is simply the complementary RNA sequence to the codon. So, C always binds with G. A always binds with U in RNA. C always binds with G. Okay, that's how you know the anticodon that corresponds to the codon. All right? Now let's have a look at rRNA, rRNA, RNA ribosomes, so R ribosomes are made of RNA, okay? Ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA. Ribosomes are enormous molecules, enormous molecules. Because they're so big, we can't draw them like we've done the messenger and the transfer RNA. So I'm going to draw them as like this. Here's here's a diagram of an a ribosome, which is made of ribosomal RNA. And ribosomes have two parts to them. There's a large subunit and a small subunit. And typically, the large and small subunit are detached from one another. In your cytoplasm, they're detached. But they come together to form a ribosome, the large and the small subunit, when they make proteins. Okay? So typically they're detached, but they come together when they make proteins. <clears throat> now, just as a side note, ribosomes are made in the nucleolus. All right, they're made in the nucleolus. All right, so let's just have a look at these for a moment. This is the site, the assembly site for proteins. Amino acids come in, they join together to form a polypeptide chain. Okay? The messenger RNA 
simply takes the information from DNA out to a ribosome. And the transfer RNAs bring in an amino acid. They carry the amino acid. Okay? The sequence of DNA determines the sequence of messenger RNA. Codons, which is just a group of three nitrogen based on the messenger RNA, will match with an anticodon on a transfer RNA, which carries an amino acid. And the amino acids are stitched together in the correct order. Now I'll show you some movies and I'll draw a diagram of all this, but they're the different players involved, right? Okay. You good? You okay with the three different kinds of RNA? So is it okay with the acids detached from the RNA? Yes, they do. Yeah. Yep. So First, remember we're looking at how proteins are made from DNA and we're going to break that up into two processes. Okay, break that up into two processes. First one we're going to talk about is transcription. Transcription is the process of where we go from DNA to messenger RNA. It's where we take the DNA sequence, transcribe it into a strand of messenger RNA. Transcription is where we go from DNA to messenger RNA. It's where we take the DNA sequence and transcribe it into a messenger RNA sequence. Okay? Yes, that the, the yellow tail coming off was the strand of messenger RNA, correct? So, let's sort of go over this step by step. DNA unzips at a specific gene. That's how trans transcription occurs. The DNA molecule unzips at a specific gene. And then an enzyme assembles a strand of messenger RNA. And a single gene gets transcribed into a single strand of messenger RNA. All right, I'm going to. You okay? I'm going to give you a very simplistic sort of view of this. If we, if our gene is 300 bases long, how long is our strand of messenger RNA going to be? 300. Okay. How many codons is that length of messenger RNA going to have? 100. And so how many amino acids will be in the polypeptide? 100. Okay. It's not as simple as that, but you can see the... Yeah. All right. So... Here's our DNA molecule, double helix. The enzyme that both unzips and makes the strand of messenger RNA is called RNA polymerase. The enzyme that both unzips the DNA and assembles the strand of messenger RNA is called RNA polymerase. That's a pretty slick enzyme, isn't it? With DNA replication, we needed helicase to unzip and DNA polymerase to make a new strand. With transcription, RNA polymerase can do both. Unzip and make a strand of messenger RNA. Okay? So, RNA polymerase then will start at the beginning of a gene. 
and it will jump onto the DNA at the beginning of the gene and it will unzip and then it will fly along the DNA molecule, unzipping at the front, zipping back up at the back, and as it flies along, it's reading the code on the DNA molecule and assembling a complementary strand of messenger RNA. When it gets to the end of the gene, there's a signal that tells the RNA, um, RNA polymerase, stop. You're at the end of the gene, stop. And then RNA polymerase just jumps off. And a strand of messenger RNA results. OK? So let's go through that again. RNA polymerase starts at the beginning of a gene. It unzips as it flies along the gene. As it flies along the gene, it reads the code in the DNA molecule and assembles a strand of messenger RNA, one nucleotide at a time, flies along. Once it gets to the end of the gene, there's a signal that says stop, you reach the end of the gene, RNA polymerase leaves, and the strand of messenger RNA, what does the strand of messenger RNA do then? Constructs. Where does all this occur? In the nucleus, what does it do? It does, it leaves the nucleus goes out of the nucleus to go to the cytoplasm to a ribosome. Should we see that movie again? Now hopefully it will... Okay, this is in your nucleus. There's your strand of DNA. This is the start of a gene. Don't worry about all of these other factors. This is the start of a gene. And let's just say that this is an activator. It says go. There we have RNA polymerase flying along the gene. Flying along. Unzips zips back up, there's our strand of messenger RNA. These little yellow units are nucleotides that fly in. Look how fast that goes. That's amazing, isn't it? It's real time. There they're flying in, the nucleotides, and they're being stitched together to form this strand of messenger RNA based on the sequence of one of the DNA strands. Okay, that then leaves the nucleus. So there's just yes, there's a free pool of nucleotides in your cytoplasm and nucleoplasm. Okay, now did you see the way all those nucleotides were flying into the to the um, RNA polymerase? Do you think there's something like directing them to go in, pushing them in? No, it's just diffusion. It's random collisions. That's even more amazing, isn't it? But as they're being used up, there's a low concentration of them, so they're going to move in by diffusion. Okay? How does it know when to stop? At the end of a gene, there's a very specific codon which says stop. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment, okay? Just says stop. You're done. Stop. So, let's draw a diagram, and I'll, I'll use the board over there, okay? I need to add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight,
I'm going to add a bit more complexity to this, but let's just keep it simple for right now. Here's DNA molecule, okay? And just one strand of it. I'm not going to put the complementary strand, but there is a complementary strand of DNA, right? And let's just say this is the start of the gene. RNA polymerase jumps on and it moves along, unzipping and assembling a strand of messenger RNA. So what nucleotide, if it transcribes this strand, what's the first nucleotide it's going to pull in or it's going to come in? It's going to be a U, okay? What's the next one? And 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 the next one, U, OK? And here's our long strand of messenger RNA molecule that starts to form. It flies along RNA polymerase until it gets to a sequence on the gene which just says stop. It's a stop sequence, a stop codon. Just says stop here. And RNA polymerase says, all right, I'm done, off. OK? So now let's draw it on the board. And I'm going to give you a, a, um, 12 bases, all right? And I want you to use that sequence that I give you. It's just a random sequence, but I want you to make sure it's 12. You know, I'll probably give you more than 12. So I'd like you to draw this. So I've given it to you 18. There's 18 bases there, OK? Okay, so RNA polymerase then is right in here. And it's flying along in this direction. And it's transcribing, let's say it's transcribing this top strand of DNA. With transcription, remember, no such thing about leading and lagging strands. That only applies to DNA replication. All right? OK. Now, RNA polymerase has already transcribed this part of the gene. OK? And we're looking at it as it's transcribing this part. So let's assemble the strand of messenger RNA that it's already stitched together. And let's sort of stop at the G. So let's work back over here. See if we've got a different color. What's our messenger RNA sequence going to be if it's transcribed this? Go on, <laughs> say hello. Mm -hmm. 
the same. Okay, that's fine. All right. I guess I should add a bit, a bit more realism to it. This would. So we would have a U, an A, and a G, and it's just about to add a C corresponding to this G. OK? And as it flies along, it would add a T, a C, sorry, not a T, a U, a C, an A, zip that up, and unzip this. OK? Everybody okay with that? Yeah. So that's transcription. It's all it is, taking the information in DNA, transcribing it to a strand of messenger RNA. All right. So the strand of messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus, goes through a nuclear pore, out into the cytoplasm to a ribosome where we have this process now of translation. So translation is when we take the messenger RNA, the information in messenger RNA, and make proteins. And translation occurs in the cytoplasm on a ribosome. All right, translation occurs in the cytoplasm on a ribosome. And it's where we take the information in messenger RNA and translate it into an amino acid sequence that will form a protein. OK? You good? So information on the RNA is used to do what? Specifically. Information in the RNA is used to do what? Yes, direct the sequence of amino acids. Direct the sequence of amino acids. The information on the RNA is used to direct the sequence of amino acids in the protein or in the polypeptide chain. And I'll show you how it does that. And then the polypeptide chain, of course, folds. Did somebody write down this 18 base long sequence? All right, good, because I'm going to erase this, but I want you, someone to yell it out and, and give it to me. And somebody wrote down the messenger RNA sequence, right? Sorry? No, don't make one up. OK. All right. So remember, three bases form a messenger RNA codon. OK? Transfer RNAs have anticodons that match each messenger RNA codon. And the transfer RNAs carry an amino acid that is specific to a particular codon. Yeah. What? Which bit? Yeah, the, last part. the transfer RNAs carry amino acids specific to one particular codon or more. Each amino acid can have one or a couple of codons that are unique to that amino acid. Well, the transfer RNAs carry an amino acid specific to one or more anticodons.
okay, which is specific to a codon. Okay. And on the ribosomes, the amino acids are linked together to form proteins in the order determined by the messenger RNA, which was determined by the DNA. And so the sequence of amino acids is ultimately determined by the sequence of bases in the messenger RNA. Sorry, the sequence of amino acids in the protein is determined by the sequence of nitrogen bases in the messenger RNA and therefore ultimately determined by the sequence of the gene.